afternoon, wherever you are again. Thank you for joining us uh, on this very special event. And to those of you who came back uh, after the last fascinating session by Professor Kaplan. We are not now reaching uh, to our panel, the second part of, of this event, uh, a panel on new trends and approaches on gender and Holocaust studies. And uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, present the chair of this panel and the, uh, to give her uh, the floor, of course. Dr. Emily Stills is a lecturer in modern history at the University of uh, Winchester, where she teaches modern British and European history, including models on Jewish history and the Holocaust. Her work explores memory and representation of the Holocaust with her first book, Holocaust Memory and National Museums in Britain, due for publication later this year. Congratulations. Dr. Steele's latest research looks at expressions of power within museum narratives of forced migration. And she is particularly interested in gendered representations of migrant experiences. Dr. Stills, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invite to come and share this really, really interesting panel. And also, uh, I very much enjoyed the keynote beforehand. So thank you. Um, so we have three papers today, and I'm going to suggest that we do all three papers and then open up the floor for question. Um, this is in the spirit of scholarship and dialogue. We may find questions that emerge coming from all three. Um, so I'm going to introduce the first speaker in our first paper. Our first speaker is Professor Andrea Petto. Uh, she is professor in the Department of Gender Studies at Central European University in Vienna, Austria, and a Doctor of Science of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Her works on gender, politics, the Holocaust and war have been translated into 23 languages. In 2018, she was awarded the All European Academy's Madame de Stael Prize for Cultural Values, and she is Dr. Honoris Causa of Sudoton University in Stockholm, Sweden. And I want to introduce the paper today that she will present, which is Gendering Perpetrator Research. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me well? Can you give a sign? Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I would like to share my screen with you. And... Um, so happy Women's Day! Fantastic that you actually, you know, organize this um, uh, uh, event. I have but fifteen minutes to share with you some interesting insights about this uh, particular research. Uh, I wrote two books which came out recently about the uh, Aerocos Party, about the invisible perpetrators in the. Uh, Hungarian Nazi movement, the Aerocross movement, and also a, a book about the a forgotten massacre in 1944. And in both books, I try to uh, somehow write in a kind of accessible and kind of easy ways. And that the, uh, uh, the conclusions I will uh, uh, write, uh, discuss with you the problems. I mean, what's, what's happening when you are writing uh, a bestseller about these topics. Uh, this, um, uh, uh, the, the massacre, uh, the forgotten massacre is actually interesting because that was the uh, first private Holocaust memorial which was erected in, um, in Budapest on the 15th of October, 1945. So that's an interesting story uh, built on uh, press memoirs, autobiographies, the different people's tribunals materials, different photo archives, and also interviews. So I did lots of interviews with people, tribunal judges, lawyers, investigative officers, survivors, and also perpetrators. So you see that um, this um, uh, research has been going on for more than 15 years. So what gives you the inspiration to do a research that actually lasts so long? Uh, and then I will talk a little bit about the methodology and uh, the issue of invisibility. 
and then about the unintended consequences. So what happens when you are writing about the gendered uh, uh, memories of, of, the, of the perpetrators? So I would like to mention two inspirations which actually influence my uh, work. First is a kind of uh, uh, historical inspiration that I, in 2000, I uh, wrote a book uh, based on interviews with neo-Nazi, conservative, far-right women in Hungary, because that was the time in 2000 when all these NGOs were flourishing. And I was, you know, I'm, since I'm coming from a very different family, I was wondering, you know, where, who are these women, where do they come from, and what, uh, what kind of ideas uh, do they have? And um, uh, then uh, I want to thank for the interviews here again uh, and for their trust. And um, this uh, book brought me the prize of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences for, uh, for um, uh, original research. And then I, I wrote a book together with Ildiko Barna about the political justice in Budapest after the Second World War, analyzing 52,000 uh, people's tribunals files and it was pretty obvious that there is a there, there is a gendered element here. So what what is that? The second inspiration is coming from what's happening in Eastern Europe and particularly in Hungary. And if Hung if uh, the events in Hungary are on the uh, main page of the BBC, that's a very bad sign. Uh, these were those events in two thousand and six, which uh, actually. Uh, uh, made the far-right movement and the neo-Nazis visible in the Hungarian context. And uh, uh, it looked like a very male phenomenon, like a testosterone phenomenon. On the other hand, it's, uh, uh, there are lots of women who participate in this uh, movement and this gendered political radicalization actually made a political imperative to ask basically questions about, you know, who are, what, what, are, what is their relationship to the past? Where do they come from? Are they similar or different? So uh, this uh, photo is the only two photographs I found about the Aerocross party uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Hungary. And you see that uh, the women were actually wearing very different uh, uh, uniform than um, uh, the women of Salo, for example. So they are having skirts. Uh, and also the other photo is the, uh, the main administrative uh, uh, institution. So they are, let's go to the invisibilization, right? So what, what, what are the reasons why these women were invisible? First of all, right after 1945, uh, the matriarchy born in need, uh, basically normalized uh, those uh, 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 women who were extraordinary. And these women were extraordinary women. And uh, they, there was no uh, really uh, any kind of uh, need for making them visible. Uh, also the Cold War uh, logic of the uh, communism and anti-communists basically uh, made uh, uh, all those uh, women who were participating in the, uh, as perpetrators, uh, as victims of the, of the uh, communist uh, 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 legal process. And the perpetrators were basically equalized with the mob and everything which, you know, the responsibility was given uh, to uh, the Germans only. But we should not only blame, uh, uh, you know, the circumstances. We should also look at, you know, our own problems, like the blind spots in history writing. Um, first of all, uh, that uh, the political activism, uh, uh, these are, you know, gendered spaces, and they are not producing those documents what the historians are usually happily finding in the archives when the archives are open and there is not a pandemic. So for in the case of the Aerocross party, when the Aerocross leaders were escaping from Budapest with the, uh, because of the approaching Red Army, they basically left all the documents of the women's sections behind, and they put all other documents on a truck and moved to uh, to the uh, Western occupation, later Western occupational zone. And now it is found in, uh, in the Institute for Zeitgeschichte in München. Uh, and the rest, which remained in Budapest, maybe resurfaced sometime from a, a Soviet, uh, from a Russian archive, but uh, at the moment it's not um, uh, uh, available. Also, the glass ceiling and the glass wall have been also present inside the 
uh, arrow cross party. So therefore, there are very little uh, resources available, unlike unless unless there were some conflicts, and then you know these women also there were lots of cat fights. So these were also producing some documents. Uh, the perpetrator research, the fascism research, uh, or mostly focusing on the traditional structures, right? And not necessarily those women who were invisible in the structures and also they were not producing uh, those documents which are available in the archives. And also women and gender history, uh, uh, mostly focusing on the uh, birthy women uh, and not those who are um, uh, the perpetrators and I also received lots of criticism from my fellow comrades that why do I waste my uh, precious paid research time on those women instead of writing the history of women, uh, uh, good women, I mean trustworthy good women. And um, uh, also the issue of um, uh, there has been lots of uh, research about the women, the evilish women who are um, uh, uh, creating these special extreme women, especially research on the uh, guards of the different concentration camps. Uh, and uh, uh, this created a special genre, but, and that's an important point I would like to make, it's basically somehow not integrated into the fabric of the different uh, uh, society and the different uh, research in relation to uh, the perpetrators. So that's why these ordinary women who were left out would be, uh, it's interesting, and that's the focus of my uh, two books. What is the specificity in Eastern Europe? Uh, sorry, this. Uh, the, uh, after 89, uh, the issue of uh, this double victimhood uh, was the main framework of the, of, the, uh, of the history writing. Therefore, uh, uh, women as perpetrators were really not uh, discussed. And uh, uh, if you look at the, I mean, as we did, we looked at the files and mostly the crimes against the property were committed, those were the crimes committed by women and the restitution, the issue of restitution has been also a, a, a very sensitive and a controversial issue. Uh, in the post 1989, this counter memorialization process, these family stories of victimhood are becoming the dominant framework of speaking about the past. And uh, in that framework, the, um, uh, the crimes which were commit committed by these women are basically uh, in becoming invisible. Uh, and the recent trends, uh, the uh, illiberalization of Eastern Europe, we see that the neoliberal neopatriarchy, what we see in Eastern Europe after 2008, uh, this also contributed to the masculinization of the profession uh, of historians and both the topics and also the, those professionals who would be interested in doing this kind of research are basically missing. Uh, and the, the illiberal uh, turn in memory politics uh, uh, created a, a need for self-censorship and only uh, presenting women as victims of communism and not as perpetrators. So in my uh, book, I was basically looking at the, uh, the, how many members, I mean, how many, this is always the question, right? So 30% of the Aerocross party had been uh, women in some, section, in some sections. And if you take into consideration that uh, the present Hungarian parliament, there are 10% women, you see that there is you know, something there which needs to be explained. And that also explained my interest connecting the present day political developments uh, with the kind of historical analogical uh, explanation. 10% uh, of the defendants of the People's Tribunals for Women and the perpetrator category has been extremely complex. Murderer, wives, doctors, administrators, artists, journalists, uh, and so on. So that um, also makes a, a epistemological and also methodological problem for what, how do you uh, cr uh, create the category of perpetrator and how do you find sources to explain that? And I listed it four concepts I'm using in my book, uh, theoretical concepts. I mean, historians are usually shy away from, from theory, but uh, these four concepts, which are coming from mostly feminist theory, uh, helps us to understand uh, uh, this uh, resurgence and this unexpected uh, popularity of the far-right mobilization in the 1930s, 40s, and I'm afraid today, uh, which is uh, the issue of agency, uh, the issue of relative power, 
uh, and also the concept of the patriarchal pact uh, that perpetuating patriarchy actually contributes gaining power and also the concept of anti-modernist emancipation which actually uh, states that there are different forms of emancipation not only uh, that form of uh, emancipation what the uh, leftist and liberal feminist movements are presenting but there are other forms of emancipations and that explains this uh, pretty unexpected popularity of uh, far-right uh, Nazi uh, fascist ideas in the 1930s and even today. So what are the impacts, the unintended consequences? So when I was writing the book in Hungarian first, you know, my purpose was, I mean, simple as that, to write a book which is in an accessible language, uh, not using the lingo of neither feminist theory nor uh, history, uh, a book which is um, uh, it's trying to map the reasons of uh, uh, invisibility and also the uh, what can historians do to unpack uh, the uh, these reasons of uh, of invisibility. And actually, I, I succeeded in uh, writing this uh, uh, book in a kind of um, you know popular way. It's a bestseller. It's selling fantastically. But uh, you know the consequences are that uh, uh, in this book I was basically uh, introducing the People's Tribunals process, and I was also writing about this uh, uh, the massacre, uh, which was uh, committed by a woman, and uh, this uh, uh, and. In the Forgotten Massacre, I'm writing about that we really don't know what has happened, how many people were killed because of the lack of sources. And this kind of reflexive, uh, critical uh, history writing is basically not going well in the popular public. So by now, I think that the no matter that the book is um, uh, was written with the best possible intentions of a feminist scholar trying to make a, uh, women uh, visible and trying to ask the question, what made uh, women uh, becoming perpetrators, murderers, and uh, and uh, compliant in uh, uh, making crimes, uh, committing crimes, actually how it ends up and how it is, uh, you know, uh, at the moment looks like in the Hungarian context is basically saying, even Andrea Petr is saying that the people's tribunals were um, uh, uh, communist uh, uh, puppet uh, courts, and we don't really know what has happened, so let's close the chapter. But I don't want to finish with this dark uh, 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 closing statement, but I just want to say that uh, uh, writing about uh, uh, perpetrators and gender perpetrators actually ch giving uh, very particular tasks in this present political climate. And of course, uh, you know, in this uh, particularly in liberal turn uh, uh, and also in the revisionist history writing, we should try to do everything possible to uh, uh, create and to write a history which is challenging those uh, uh, issues of invisibility. So that's what I wanted to share with you, my personal story and my motivation. And I'm really looking forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very interesting paper to open us up with. Um, anyone that has any questions, do feel free to start posting in the chat box. Um, we will take those after all three. So the second paper or our second speaker I will introduce is uh, Professor Beverly Chalmers. Uh, Professor Beverly Chalmers' research examines the birth and sexual experiences of women and children in difficult religious, social, political and economic situations, including in the Holocaust. She has over 300 publications, including 57 book chapters, uh, 10 books to her credit, and she's given over 460 conference presentations globally. She has undertaken over 140 international health promotion activities in more than 30 countries in the field of perinatal health. Professor Chalmers has two doctoral degrees, one in humanities, a PhD in psychology, and the other in medicine in multicultural childbirth. Now an independent scholar, she has held full professorial positions in universities in both Canada and South Africa. And today, um, Professor Chalmers will be presenting her paper, Sexual Abuse of Women in the Holocaust. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Everything okay? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, perfect. Thank um, you. Thank you. I will uh, begin my talk um, addressing the uh, sexual abuse of women during the Holocaust based on my book, Birth, Sex and Abuse, Women's Voices Under Nazi Rule. Um, the sources for this book are uh, really based on the experiences of a few hundred women who lived and the voices of millions who died are obviously not heard. Um, I went to diaries, to memoirs, testimonies and archives and of course academic studies on women in the Holocaust very much simula simulated by Marion Kaplan's work to begin with too. And I must apologize at the beginning, there's no nice way of reporting the horrors of the Holocaust. The voices of women reveal a specter of brutality that is often laced with misogynistic enjoyment and that does come through and there's uh, no way around it really. We've heard a lot about the direct causes of genocide. We read often about the gas chambers, torture, starvation, disease, intolerable conditions in camps and so on. Um, but there are also indirect causes of, or more indirect causes of genocide. And one of them is the manipulation of reproductive life to eliminate the Jewish people. Um, and it's based on, if you look at the Genocide Convention of 1948, one of the articles that described uh, def defined genocide is imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group. And this is very much what was part of the Nazi policy. Um, the book, my book uh, deals with uh, reproductive life in two ways. Uh, there is half of the book deals with childbearing and issues like, such as pregnancy, birth, abortion, sterilization of women. And the other half deals with sexuality, the sexual contact of women, issues like prostitution or sex work, rape, sexual abuse. And I will deal mainly with the sexuality issues in today's talk. One of the questions that was challenging at the beginning was the question of rape of Jewish women. And it was often su suggested that, oh, that didn't really occur. Um, David O'Leary's drawings, he was a prisoner in Auschwitz, Auschwitz, actually show many issues and pictures depicting the rape of Jewish women. But the questions that asked is, were women protected by the, the Rassenschande laws? Um, and the answer is no. Um, despite the fact that survivors were often reluctant to report about rape or sex, us as researchers were reluctant to explore the issue. We simply didn't ask women and in, in, in gaining testimonies from them, for example. And there is huge difficulty in searching the archives. It's quite hard to get access to this information. But rape of women did occur, Jewish women did occur. It occurred everywhere, in hiding, in prisons, in ghettos, in camps, uh, perpetrated by Wehrmacht soldiers, guards, the SS, non-German civilians. It occurred in brothels and in private homes. Sometimes, a few uh, instances that I came across, it was perpetrated by Jewish men. Women of all ages were raped and in multiple countries. And rape occurred both in public and in private. Some women survived and testified. Some testified about other women that they saw being raped. Some women remained silent and many were murdered. But if we look through a little bit chronologically in the ghettos, um, despite the abject poverty or despair, the abnormality of life, romance happened, marriages still occurred, there was flirting, life continued in some ways as normal, but some women also, as conditions became worse and worse, some women had to resort to sex work, to prostitution, to try to gain some form of money and survival. Roundups occurred in ghettos, in towns and in villages, as we know, and these were accompanied by beatings, by public births, women were sometimes made to give birth in public if they were in labor at the time of the roundups, just for the stimulation of those, uh, the SS or whoever were uh, rounding them up um, out of curiosity. Some babies were hit against the walls to kill them or the babies were thrown from maternity wards onto the trucks below. Babies were used for target practice. Pregnant women were often eviscerated um, and children and women were raped. Part of this process of rounding them up usually often involved body searches, internal searches of women's bodies. Um, and 
as uh, Sylvia Gross Martin writes, she said, I had seen women completely naked with their legs spread in a knee bent position, their upper body bent all the way down. They stood motionless with everything exposed, their faces to the wall and the guards did the examining. Obviously they were looking for jewelry, but in a process it, they were digitally raping these women. Sexual humiliation continued into the camps. And as Marion mentioned, bodily hair would be shaved, names were replaced with numbers, their identify, identity was withdrawn, was uh, eliminated, they had to wear identifying badges, nudity was common, they were often made to, to parade naked, naked or uh, be assessed naked, internal searches continued, and of course they were overworked, beaten and starved. But some of the worst situations in which, or worst, you can't judge, some of the situations in which sex occurred in the camps were in the latrines, the Auschwitz latrines, for example, and Terence Dupre talks of this as excremental assault, these latrines. Um, in the camps, the romance sometimes occurred, although contact was often prohibited, but also sexual exchange took place. The bartering of sex to, to, to go and earn something, something that might help them to survive. And with workmen who came into the camps or senior people in the camps, the cooks, for example, um, it was possible to, some, to sometimes exchange sex in order to get a shoelace or a, a, a scrap of bread. And this is where much of the sexual contact for exchange usually took place. Now, the Germans had instituted a statewide controlled and in multi countries, every country they, they went into, a state controlled network of brothels. Um, and the purpose of these was partly to satisfy the needs of German soldiers, to provide an incentive for higher productivity, and to avoid soldiers' infection. During the First World War, many of the German soldiers had been infected with sexually transmitted infections. And this was one way of trying to prevent this by controlling the brothels where they could uh, monitor the sex workers. And some have suggested that um, brothels provided an acceptable sexual outlet for the ex enormous exposure to nudity that occurred in the camps. Because prostitution also occurred in the camps, brothels were uh, created in a number of the camps. And prisoners, women were, had to, uh, could volunteer. They were offered better living conditions, which is true for the while, the few months that they might live, but otherwise they were volunteered. Um, each woman would have, uh, each man would have 15 minutes with the woman. A woman might be raped by eight to 40 men in one session, one evening or one day. Um, bells would signal when the men could go into the room and when they had to finish. There were peepholes in the doors so that the guards could check what was happening. Men would pay what was equivalent of a week's work to be with a woman. And any infections in the women or pregnancy that might result from this usually meant the woman was killed. And the brothels were usually open to Germans and foreigners. But Jewish women were also forced to serve as prostitutes in these concentration camps, military brothels. There are a number of testimonies that have emerged of these women, but one of the most um, distinctive is uh, of a couple who was reunited after the war, and she had been tattooed with the words prostitute for the armies of Hitler. And they applied to Rabbi Oshri in 1949 for a halachic ruling, which he gave permitting Jewish women who were forced to work as prostitutes to resume their marital lives. It's some of the best evidence for the fact that this did, ha did happen. Abuse and brutality were common. The Einsatzgruppen also were part of the raping uh, perpetrators. They were individuals and both men and women were known to abuse and rape. In prisons, rape occurred. Klaus Barbie is one of the most famous of these uh, perpetrators. He would beat women when they were naked, torture them, and he would mutilate their breasts, but he would also train his dogs to mount the women. There was sexual brutality in the camps. Ivan Demanyuk in Treblinka was known for stabbing women around the thighs and raping them. Tauber in Auschwitz would select women for the, for the, 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 the brothels uh, based on whether they had drooping breasts or not. And he would walk down the lines, flipping their breasts with a, with a whip. Um, to see if they would uh, move too much. And Ilse Kochenbuchenwald was renowned for her debauchery and the tattoos, her tattooed skins that she would collect from prisoners that she uh, noted in the camps. 
Irma Grisa, the bitch of Belsen, in, he was in Ravensbrück, in Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen. She was in responsible for 30,000 Jewish female prisoners at times. And she was known for savaging prisoners with trained dogs, for sexual excesses herself, for arbitrary shootings of people, and selecting prisoners for the gas chambers. The doctors who worked in some of these camps reported that she became sexually aroused when watching breast surgery and she used to request that the doctors called her when there was breast surgery going on. And even more so, she would go through the camps with a, a plaited whip and beat the breasts of women so that they would become infected and then have to go for surgery to clean the wounds when she would want to watch. Other camps in Flossenburg, uh, which was a, a camp that, to which many of the homosexuals were sent, the commandant himself was noted to become sexually aroused while he was watching homosexuals beaten, which he often then perpetrated. But it wasn't only women, but children who were abused as women. And this is a second book which I wrote uh, on child sex abuse in the Holocaust. And in this, I came across 160 children whose stories I could tell. The average age of the children that I was looking were reported in the book was 11 years old. So they ranged from about five to 15. And I didn't look any older than that. Um, it was a difficult book to write because the subject is taboo. And that was the very first word that was told to me when I first went to an archive actually in Israel. And some, the archivist said to me, you know the subject is taboo, of course, you'll never get access to the archives. And it's true that some of the archives did refuse to let me in. Um, the comments that were passed or the arguments that were put to this was that it's not necessary to talk about these things. It's degrading to the memory of the Holocaust or that's impossible, never would a German, an SS soldier touch a Jewish girl. It was forbidden, the Russian Shanda concern. Um, concerns about re-traumatizing the victim or their family, especially if the family could identify the victim. And that led to huge concerns about remain, retaining women's privacy, which I did in the book. And horror to think that such things happened or disbelief of children's stories, children who told stories that they'd been sexually abused were discounted, they were not believed, what could you know about such things that was told to them. And there was fear that some of this information could be misused by Holocaust deniers or revisionists. But I always came back to the bottom line that I thought women and children who who told their stories wanted them to be known otherwise they would not have reported them they might well have wanted to have privacy about their identities but they certainly wanted their experiences to be recognized and to be known and we have ignored these up to now where did child sex abuse occur everywhere in homes in ghettos in labor camps and extermination camps some children in medical experiments were sexually manipulated children who were in hiding were sexually abused the Einsatzgruppen and the Wehrmacht were known for attacking children among the kinder transport children we I found a number of testimonies of children who'd been abused in their families that had taken them on look after them children sent to safety beyond Europe's borders and children in the DP camps and some of the children were abused simply as Jews or while they were passing for Aryan. These are some of the major categories. I had 29 children who were abused in hiding, 26 who were abused by soldiers, 22 uh, talking about sexual abuse in the ghettos, and 15 girls in camps and 17 boys in camps uh, are, are some of the stories included in the book. Just to give you an example, the story of Melania Weissenberg, or her book is called Molly's Diary, um, she was hidden together with an older cousin of hers, Helene, underground in a, in a hole in the ground which was the size of perhaps a, a double bed on which they could lie down but she couldn't sit up and she and her sister were kept there for two years. She was helped by a farmer, Viktor Wojcik and his sister and they became afraid sometime during the, their period of hiding that uh, Victor was losing interest or was becoming fearful of being discovered and, and himself being uh, killed for, for hiding them. And they decided to uh, entice him to exchange sex in order to keep them alive and keep feeding them and looking after them, which they did do. And she reported this in her diary. By the way, I think she is still alive. Another incident, Susie Berhofer and her, her sister Lotte, they were three years old when they were sent on the kinder transport to England. They were sheltered by a reverend man and his wife Irene. 
He began to sexually abuse Susie from the time she was nine years old. And she complied with this because she was terrified that they would stop looking after her twin sister who was ill and ailing. He prevented having her having contact with older boys or men. She eventually dated and married in secret. And in 1988, many years later, she entered therapy and began to find, wonder where she had come from on the kinder transport, where she'd come from in Europe. And she eventually discovered her Jewish origins. The Reverend and his wife had never told her. And he was never for her, his story became exposed at that point. And uh, he was never formally charged for, for his crimes. What happened after the war? Women survivors were treated with suspicion. And the thought was, did they use sexual behavior to survive? One story is of a woman who uh, was catching a bus in Israel and she reached up to uh, reach the, to hold on for support and her sleeve fell down revealing her Auschwitz tattoo. And someone nearby her turned around and said, oh, isn't it interesting how only the pretty and the young girls managed to survive? Obviously implying she had used sex in order to survive. Women kept silent about their experiences, even from their partners. Many had never told their partners for decades that they had been sexually abused. And many of the women report never enjoying sex in their lives after the war. How could this happen? In our normal world, we require an explanation. And some of the theories we've come up with as to how could people do this is authoritarianism or that they just simply were obeying orders, um, anti-Semitism, or that the society had become morally disengaged. They distanced themselves from these actions. It was not, uh, not relevant to them, or simply that it was because of self-interest. But if we think about the Nazis in their own time, they viewed such acts as normal, and desirable. They thought their actions were heroic, were admired, were praiseworthy. Their actions were not incongruent with their normal selves. It was in keeping with their personal sense of integrity. They believed that this whole process of the Holocaust, what they were doing was right. Major General Globocznik in 1942 gave a speech and in the speech he said, but gentlemen, if after us such a cowardly and rotten generation to arise that it does not understand our work, which is so good and so necessary, then gentlemen, all national socialism would have been for nothing. On the contrary, bronze plaques should be put up with the inscription that it was we, we who had the courage to achieve this gigantic task and Hitler agreed with him. This kind, this concern of rape during war is a global concern. Rape is currently a spoil of war, it's a reward for soldiers, or it's used as a weapon of war to dehumanize the other, make it easier to kill them and to humiliate them. Um, sexual slavery is a problem. Sexualized cruelty is a problem globally and sexual trafficking for economic gain is something that we face every day today. If we step back a little bit, just to conclude, Yael Danieli, an Israeli writer and scholar, put together the idea that there are four blows that shatter the belief that humanity has that we are really good people. And the first of these, she says, came from the cosmological blow, as Copernicus put out the idea that we are not the center of the universe. The biological blow came from Darwin, when he claimed that mankind's supremacy over the animal kingdom was in question. The psychological blow came later from Freud, where he put out the idea that the ego is not the master of the psyche. We don't control all our actions in our conscious world. And the ethical blow was the last that Daniele put together, that the Nazis destroy the idea that our world is a just place. I've added the ideological blow, that ideologies, including some formalized religions as opposed to spiritual people, and acts perpetrated within such often extremist frameworks have led to our moral, ethical, and spiritual impoverishment. As Father Patrick Desbois writes, an ideology can deceive minds to the point of annihilating all ethical reflexes and all recognition of the human in the other. I am convinced that there is only one race, a human race that shoots two-year-old children. And I've added to that, and abuses them physically, emotionally, and sexually first. And I write these books with respect to the women and the children who experience sexual abuse during and after the Holocaust. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that paper. I'm sure it raised uh, a number of questions for people. So do post in the chat and I will pick them up at the end. So our third and final paper today is from Dr. Boaz Cohen. Dr. Boaz Cohen is head of the Holocaust Studies Programme of the Western Galilee College in Akko, Israel. He also teaches at the Shannon College in Haifa and, and is a, an affiliated research fellow at the Centre for Collective Violence Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the UCL Institute for Advanced Studies. His work focuses on the development of Holocaust memory and historiography in their social and cultural context and on Jewish and Israeli post-Holocaust society. His current research focuses on work with survivor children after the Holocaust, their rehabilitation and the collection of their testimonies. And today, uh, Dr. Cohen is presenting his paper, Lena Kukler and her 100 children. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Just a minute, I'll put my stopwatch. Uh, we had perpetrators, then we had sexual abuse, and now I want to uh, talk uh, about one woman. And uh, the equation of theorizing will got, come up here at the end. But I want to tell a story of a, a woman who did not get enough recognition at her time, but neither did men who did such work. Uh, and this is uh, Lena Kichler. I will talk, I'll explain who, the, who she is, and then I'll start getting into in depth. Uh, so this is a, in a small uh, letters, I say it. Uh, she she grew up. In, uh, she was born 1910. Uh, studied in Krakow. Started academic studies too. Uh, she was on her way to a PhD. She had to stop because she had to. She had no money, and she worked as a teacher. Uh, when the uh, during the Holocaust, she lost a daughter, and uh, her husband uh, left her. He said he'll be, his chances of survival are better without her. And uh, she managed to get a fake a document. She went to Warsaw from Warsaw. She went through the Polish family uh, of some sort of a well-to-do family with a farm in a, a noble family. And she went, uh, she was with them and she was teaching their children. After the war, she opened the school for all the, the school children, and the, then she came back to Krakow. Now, she comes back to Krakow, she finds out uh, no one is left from the family. Uh, she does find a brother uh, who is high up in the communist hierarchy, and he, she, she has somewhere to live. She lives with him. And uh, she's asked to come back to the university and to finish a PhD. She's working on the uh, child perceptions of speciality and the uh, cognition and uh, this stuff. And uh, one day accidentally, oh no, oh, sorry, she says she was, uh, she went to the Jewish commission in Krakow and she saw that now Jewish committees were places where all the Jewish survivors coalesced. And there was, a, it was like, terrible place, a lot of people shouting, trying to find relatives, trying to get aid. And in the top floor, there were children who the, uh, who the, community, the committee collected or were brought by the non-Jews who uh, uh, sheltered them. And uh, they live in terrible conditions and it's really terrible. And uh, what her, this changes her life. The, she's offered to open, to take care of the children. She re, uh, answers with an idea to take them to the country, to Jakupana, which is a resort, get a place there, renovate it and give them a home. With this is done, I will not say now how she gets the money for all this, uh, but she has to get the funding. Although this is a community effort, no one has the money for this. Uh, she's in uh, Jacopana. It's like it's very nice, except for two small problems. Uh, a lot of anti-Semitism in the schools. She can't send the children to school because they are being attacked. 
and then they are being attacked by a, a nationalist militias, a, attacked with weapons and grenades. And uh, we are talking about armed attacks. Now, when you read their books, you think maybe she, this is just a lot of drama, but actually we are talking about, uh, uh, we have a research now on what goes on in Jakupana after the Holocaust, we have a, a, a Carolina Pants has done name by name of victims uh, and name by name of attackers. And uh, uh, so she finds a way to smuggle the whole group to, uh, to, to Czechoslovakia from there to France. Uh, and then she reaches uh, Eretz Israel in 1949. The children are growing up. They, some, some of them are together. She's with them for two years, then she has a life, gets married, and at the age of 40 plus plus, gives birth to a girl. Uh, and she, so she has a child, and one child she did have. Okay, so this is just an overview. Uh, her general message is, uh, approach to the children, is that it's all about trust. When we talk today about children at risk, we have to remember children who came out of the Holocaust, maybe they underwent what Bev was talking about. Uh, they lose their faith in humanity. I mean, even when you hear such a presentation like yours, we lose our faith in humanity, but uh, and they have a very good personal reasons to lose them also. Uh, they are truants, they are street urchins, they are violent, uh, some are like that, some are have lost, are apathic. And the adults don't exactly know what to do with these people, uh, with these children. And she, uh, and they want to throw some of the children out because they are uh, uh, delinquents. And she says all these children lost their faith in humanity because at an early age, they, so only the evil in people, all people will perceive this evil until proven, unless proven otherwise. So this is the way these children look at the world. And she has this uh, challenge to uh, find a way to, to change this. And this is a bit about the children, but uh, uh, again, she says, these children survived the war by stealing and lying it was their best weapon during the war. After they lost security, family, community, home, they will obviously not throw this, this is my mistake, away now that the war is over. So you can't teach these children about uh, ethics. You can't demand certain behaviors from them. You have to take into, to give them time to educate them, help them regain trust. So we, the issue of trust is always very strong in all this, but also, uh, as you will see, uh, she has a very, uh, uh, I would not say, maybe feminine approach to how to work with these children. These are boys and girls, yes? And the ages are from uh, uh, toddlers or a bit more to uh, 15 year olds. This is Jacopana. This is the, uh, the home she gets. Uh, how did she? managed to finance the move to Jacopana. And now what we can see is that she's very good at knocking, uh, kicking down, kicking doors. She goes to the Russian authorities in, uh, in uh, Krakow. She is, in the end, she gets a truckload of uh, sugar. And this is a currency in the black market. And with this truckload of sugar, they rent this house and renovate it for the children. And these are photos of armed children. Uh, some of the children, maybe not these ages, really did use weapons in defending the home against attacks. Not only adults were defending, but also young 11-year-olds, uh, 14-year-olds who were in the partisans and who knew how to use weapons. Uh, so she has a very uh, interesting approach that what these children need is not an institution, they need a home, a family. And the first story that uh, is interesting is that when she first comes to the children, she brings sandwiches. Uh, when she 
they choose get to Jacopana, they enter the dining room and it's all set with a, a china plates and a shiny cutlery. And uh, there's a lot of bread, a lot of food. All, this is something that happens all over that you need to give the children as much bread as they want, not uh, ration it. And now the interesting thing is she talks a lot about this special meal, first meal in the children's home. But the children also talk about it. There's a 2003 movie about Lena Kichler and her, and her children. And they took seven of the children back to Poland. It's done by Osho Schwartz. It's an amazing movie, it has English subtitles. They take her, them back to Poland and they tell her whole story. And they also found TV uh, programs she did with teenagers in Israel. And anyway, this guy, Nathan, he, he stands there in the movie and he gives the whole menu of the meal. He said, I will never forget it until the day I die. And he doesn't forget it. He gives the full menu of that meal. I mean, the, the idea that there is food, uh, what I said, food is love. Uh, the main uh, point that guides her work is the issue of mother. She sees herself as this children's mother. I mean, it starts with the children calling her mother. And in the end, it turned out that many of the children were calling her mother. And uh, she was interviewed in 1946 by David Boder. The transcript is up there on the web, also the recording. She speaks in two languages or three. My feeling towards the children is the feeling of a mother tower the children born to her, maybe even deeper. I protect these children. I will go on protecting them as long as they are with me. Now, this issue of protecting the children, she is the only, she smuggles the whole children's home out of Poland because of danger to the children. When they are in France, she moves the children from one Jewish organization, the one who took her from Poland, and to another one because she's not happy with the treatment the children are getting. She is fighting for the children. <laughs> this is a major now, a, I will talk later about what this means fighting with institutions, but I'm, she explains who she took as staff. And she tells the, these women, uh, you lost your children in Auschwitz. You don't have the children to hug, but these children who do not have their parents, we should become true mothers to these children. So the, 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 the cultural is being a mother. And that's the way she treats. And this also means that the children's home is a family. We don't have an institute. The child wants to live when they're in France. He wants to uh, go to Israel. She says, we don't have an institution. You can't, so you can't leave it. We have a family. Uh, we have a new, we all lost our families. So we established a new family composed of many children and mothers. So she has many examples, but I want to, to, to move uh, to the context and to the questions. So I'm an historian, so theorizing is not uh, my forte. Uh, and I'm also at, uh, not sure what I want to theorize from this, but I will say several things. First of all, she's not alone. I've written a paper on about uh, in Holocaust and Genocide Studies about Holocaust, about uh, women caretakers survivor caretakers, women survivor caretakers, and survivor children, which we, we track the story of three women. She is one of them and there are others. So how much is this story representative? She is, was an amazing woman, but can we uh, generalize from it something for the future? I'll say one word about it in then. Uh, she stresses the issue of mother. Now I saw in the Yad Vashem site when they were writing about her, they were using the term surrogate mothers. Now I never heard her or any other caretaker talking about herself as a surrogate mother. She needed, she had to be motherly or a mother for the children. But the, the, the term surrogate mother, which is maybe 
will be a professional term here. This is uh, not something that you hear these women talking about. And then men. <laughs> what is the, uh, she wrote a lot, Elena Kichler. She had this, she recorded the children's experiences. She wrote, she published books. Her ma a, a main book is, uh, which was translated to many languages, is My Hundred Children. Uh, she was not happy with any of the translations, but it was translated. Uh, there's a Hollywood movie, a sort of a feature movie done on her. Uh, but she writes a lot, and her papers are in the Ghetto Fighters' house, and uh, uh, so she describes. She so she describes the work. So what is the place of men in this story? First, you have the first man is her husband who uh, leaves her during the war and wants to come back after the war, but she refuses. Uh, we have uh, the men where she's hiding who are hitting on her, but not. At least as she tells it, a very, it, it, nothing of, a, it doesn't go past a flirting. A, but she is a, working with institutions, the Jewish committee, the procurement office of the Soviet authorities, the school superintendent in the Zakopana area, who she succeeds in bringing to the Jabkopana schools to force the teachers to, to, get, to take the Jewish children to, to accept them to schools. And she needs the superintendent for this. And he, he comes. So she, in a way, uh, she is very adept, adept at uh, uh, getting people to uh, enlist to in the, her projects, to work for her projects. And I think this is a, a, an important point. Uh, another issue that is a concern to men is what happens with men caretakers? You know, we hear a lot about women in the Holocaust. We also hear that women were adapting much better than men. And uh, we hear a lot of stories like that. Uh, I just learned that a young researcher in Israel is now doing a postdoc in Yad Vashem writing about fathers in the Holocaust. We have nothing about fathers in the Holocaust, although there are a lot of memoirs, both by fathers and by children who were with their fathers. This is one thing. Another thing is, what about men caretakers? They obviously didn't adapt the mother role, but what role did they adapt? And uh, can we say that women were always successful and motherly and men were more disciplinarian and uh, uh, aloof? I don't know. We don't have research. We have a lot of sources on women caretakers. We have, and I've written some, uh, some other people have looked at this, but no one has looked at men. And I think this, if we get the, the masculine angle, we might have a much better picture of what it was really going on and how to assess or evaluate the work of women, female caretakers, male caretakers, uh, mothers and fathers, etc. So I will uh, stop here and leave time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. They were three very different um, perspectives on gender uh, and the Holocaust. So I think it's going to have raised quite a few um, uh, interesting questions uh, and some that may, may bridge all three, but some that may be more individual. Um, I found it quite interesting there, the, the kind of move from perpetrators to, to sexual violence to rehabilitation. Um, transition between those three topics was quite difficult um, in terms of, um, I suppose, thinking my own way through issues of gender um, in what I, I study as well. Um, I will turn the floor over to questions. 
Um, I'm just looking at what we have here. Okay, so it's jumped me back down to the bottom, so bear with me one second. Um, so there's a question here, which I think is for uh, Professor P uh, Petto here, uh, double victimhood theory. Did this lead to the double genocide theory used now in Lithuania and other Eastern European countries to downplay the Holocaust in equating Lithuanian suffering under the Soviets with the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I uh, posted uh, an article which I wrote about the change, uh, paradigm change in Holocaust memorialization, where I actually identified seven steps, what is happening now in the uh, in, in the European context, changing the uh, Holocaust narrative. And definitely, uh, this is one of the important elements, uh, namely that um, uh, with the uh, European Union enlargement, this part of Europe had been become a part of the uh, European community, which had uh, experienced the Soviet occupation. Therefore, uh, from this point onwards, there had been very strong uh, attempts to somehow de-universalize the uh, uh, Holocaust uh, narrative and to somehow minimalize and, uh, and to make it, it comparable to the uh, Soviet occupation. And uh, the Baltic states, of course, were the, were the first ones. And uh, the Hungarian government jumped on this bandwagon in 2010, and especially in 2014 with the Holocaust Memorial Year. And I wrote a lot about this. So if you're interested, you can look it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to jump down a little bit to, to share the questions among speakers rather than do all at once. So I, if I've missed your question, I'm, I'm going to return to it. But this one is for Professor Chalmers. What are your sources for Greece? Um, a lot of these claims are questioned if it's just Pearl that you are using. Did you want to offer a response to that? Thank you. Um, I would have to resort to the book. I have a thousand of a couple of thousand references in there, and I do not have them off the top of my head. So they are in the book, the references that I used. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so um, to uh, okay. Bear with me, it jumps down again. Technology is not my uh, my my preference <laughs> for these uh, for these days. Um, so here's a question for uh, Professor Cohen here. How long did uh, the homes operate for? What happened to the children, and what happened to Lena and the other mothers? Thank you. I will uh, answer also the question before that. Uh, I'm very aware of the work of my Magdalena. We have worked together and I mean, we've been in touch more than once and uh, I think she's doing an amazing work. I just hope to see it published sometime. I think it's very important that people are looking at the work of, the, of these amazing women. And now I'll answer about the homes. We are talking about, uh, uh, with Lena Kichler, for example, we are talking about the immediate post-Holocaust years she starts at 46 or even 45. I think 46. The, she, in 46, she also is, maybe she starts 45. 46, she, they escape from Poland and they smuggle the border from Poland. She moves on uh, to France. Uh, she, uh, she has to wait for uh, the establishment of the state of Israel to be able to get to, to Israel. And then she, many of the children, are, the grown-ups have already moved by themselves. And uh, she's left with a group of 34 children. They are all taken into one uh, agricultural settlement in Israel, Kvutzat Shiler, the Shiler group. And they have built a home for them. And in the, the, she is with them for the two, first one or two years until they uh, get settled. Then she moves uh, to the town to give her time, and she, her home becomes a, a center for these children. She is in touch with these children until her death. 
they come, they bring their, she's in the weddings, they bring their uh, children. Now this is interesting because this happens in other children's homes. I mean, there's a small group of caretakers, women in this case, where the children, uh, 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 one group celebrated the 90th birthday of their caretaker a few years ago. Uh, so some of them were already dead, so their children came. So uh, the, the connections are real. They exist also after the institutional phase. So this is, I say, generally children's homes were there until children grew up. We see them all over Europe. Uh, they are uh, the homes that manage to move the children to Eretz Israel. They get you, many of them get to kibbutzim, and uh, we have uh, on our site on the site where you registered. There's an amazing recording from la our last event of uh, Mickey Dro, who researched one group like that, who came from a children's home, get to go to the kibbutz, and they are there still as a very close knit group. Uh, so some connections went on, some connections uh, disappeared, but uh, all work with children always ends when they grow up. I mean, there's one stage where they stop being children and then, uh, and then you have to take them to another uh, seminar. They don't belong to this seminar anymore. Uh, Thank you. Another question here for Professor uh, Peto. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I was wondering if you could say more about your notion of anti-modernist emancipation and how you position that in the framework of reading of fascism as modern and modernist, albeit uh, clearly positing an alternative modernity to the liberal socialist ones that we typically read as modernist. Thank you. I sent um, a, a longer version of this uh, response, it is in the chat, you can download that. So basically I was, uh, in my work, I was handling the um, uh, fascism as the modern, uh, this anti-modernist uh, uh, modern, uh, following Roger Griffin's uh, argumentation. And uh, if I uh, read the stories of these women, so how, well, how do they explain that why did they join this movement and not the uh, leftist movement or the social democratic movement? Uh, so what made them uh, joining this uh, particular movement? It's uh, pretty obvious that they wanted to make change. They, the doctors, the medical doctors, they, want, they were appalled by the poverty which is out there. And for them, the leftist uh, uh, social democratic uh, alternative was not an option because of two reasons. First, because after the First World War in the, uh, uh, the leftist and social democratic movements were uh, blamed for the uh, loss of the First World War. This is very much like the Dolstos uh, mis. Uh, in, in Hungary, and secondly, because of the violent uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, so for them, the social democratic and the trade union movement was not really an option. Therefore, they uh, try to uh, be active in these movements and to uh, uh, implement change there, to educate women, to improve social conditions. And uh, also it was the as I wrote to the question uh, uh, by uh, Boaz, uh, this was the Arrow Cross Party, which first submitted a bill uh, in the Hungarian parliament to punish sexual violence in the workplace. So this kind of, uh, 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 this which, which hasn't been on the agenda of any kind of uh, other political movements, but this, um, uh, the, the Arrow Cross Party. Uh, of course, with the racial, uh, undertone saying that the kind of um, uh, honest, nice, innocent Hungarian uh, working women should be protected from the uh, uh, Jewish capitalists who are exploiting the uh, the uh, the workforce. So uh, 
and, and this kind of exclusionary um, uh, narrative uh, uh, was, was very uh, uh, attracted a lot of women. And uh, they were um, uh, not only fee paying members, but also supporters of the, of the, of the, of the Arrow Cross Party. And uh, why is this important here and now? It is important here and now when we want to understand why so many women voted for Trump. If you look at the recent elections, uh, there is a fantastic uh, uh, gender gap. More than 52% of the women voted for Trump. Uh, so you, you need to explain this. And uh, also you have to explain why the, the, the modernism which you, which is considered to be the more normal, the new normal is losing constant support. And uh, uh, in, in that sense, um, uh, I tried to write this book explaining that uh, these women uh, who were so many in the Aerocross party that at a certain point, the conservative um, uh, press was speaking about the Aerocross party as a feminist party. They were using this term feminist, that they are feminist. And uh, uh, this is the worst label you can imagine in the conservative, uh, um, uh, Christian conservative uh, Hungarian context, that these women actually wanted to implement change. So this revolutionary modernism based on exclusion and also controlling the very uh, limited resources which were uh, available. So in that sense, I think you know, we can learn from these analogies and from this historical comparison when we are trying to understand uh, our today's world, uh, uh, why so many uh, women are uh, voting for uh, those uh, politicians and those political movements who we would otherwise would consider uh, misogynist and uh, hateful and racist. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. There's a, a couple of questions that I want to pose at the same time to Professor Chalmers. The first is a question on how you deal with survivor testimony that you cannot cross-reference with another source and why you think the stories of rape have taken so very long to surface. Or has this been buried in historic works and not generally available to the public? Okay, the first question about uh, the inability to cross-reference survivor testimony. Yes, each testimony is individual and you cannot always cross-reference it with any other documentation. But in the kind of work that I've done, I've searched for trends and uh, patterns so that I will, if I come across a single survivor testimony, that is one person, very valid, but it's one person's experience. When I start to read dozens and dozens of reports, then I begin to think there is a trend. There's a pattern of what actually was happening here um, that we can find. When I was working on uh, both sex and abuse, um, I was looking for women's experiences of rape. And I kept coming across these anecdotes about children who'd been raped. And it was only after reading dozens of them that I decided that this was something something that hadn't been openly uh, exposed and that I needed to, to search for, uh, which led me into writing the second book. Um, so yes, you cannot cross reference every testimony, but you can see if that story is fairly common among a number of people, which lends it a little bit more um, generalizability. Not validity, because every person's story is individual and, and is valid. But if you're looking for patterns of what happened, you need to find many more stories that corroborate that issue. The other question is, why has the question of rape not come to the surface before now? And is this buried in history? Um, I don't think so. I think we have to think back to the kind, the time uh, that was at that time and how women were brought up. Um, women were very much uh, less um, willing to discuss such personal intimate details. It was a very much more conservative society and one didn't talk about these things. In addition, women who immediately after the war had been raped or abused wouldn't tell their partners because in a way it was uh, emasculating for men. And that's, the, you know, it, it led to their inability to protect their, their women or their wives uh, was often 
cited as a, as a reason why women didn't want to tell their husbands because it would make them feel bad. And that's in effect what is happening today in war. Uh, the deliberate intention is to rape women so that the men feel emasculated. And it's a part of the weaponry that is used to uh, against the enemy is to degrade them and humiliate them. And I think that was some of the story behind rape then. But the other side of it too, as I said, is that we didn't ask about these things. Uh, when the Yale University, the Fortunoff Library archives were developed and the testimonies were created, it was specifically told to the women that um, these stories were really for their families to read and for their children to get to know what had happened to them, to record it for posterity. And women didn't want their children to know that they'd been raped. So nobody asked them, did you, were you sexually harassed? Did you have any sexual encounters? That was not part of the, the questionnaires. By the time the Shoah Foundation uh, started much later, uh, then there were uh, more explicit ex exploratory questions about what had happened. And women who chose to tell the story but asked that it not be made public could say so. And those testimonies are the ones that are in, the, in archives but are private. You cannot access them. Um, and these are the ones that I had the most difficulty with in, in uh, when I approached various uh, uh, archives. I must admit, this is a Ghetto Fighters House or, uh, uh, series, and the Ghetto Fighters House was phenomenal in allowing me access to these stories, obviously provided I would retain the privacy and, and uh, secrecy of the, the testimony's name, so it doesn't embarrass them or their families. I omitted, which is a non-historical way of doing things, but I left out details about their identity and where they particularly specifics of where they live um, in order to make it impossible for anyone reading the book to um, to access their, their private information. I have the codes of who I whose testimonies I used, but you cannot access them through the book in order to preserve privacy. If women had personally written about their stories in books or testimonies or memoirs, um, I would use their names and their places and details, but not if they had requested privacy for their testimonies. But to get access to them was difficult. The, the libraries didn't uh, make it easy for me, put it that way. Of about 13 different libraries in, in Canada that I tried to access, I could only get them through one. Um, in Israel, I did manage to get through the Ghetto Fighters House and a couple of others, but not a lot. Very difficult access in Israel. I don't know if that answers your questions. Um, rape, I think, is just something we don't we didn't talk about until recently. It's very much a, a, a modern, the last few decades when we are feel more free to express things about rape and sexual abuse. And obviously, we see things like the Me Too movement coming now. This is a modern phenomenon where we are exposing sexual interactions and especially those that are derogatory in a much more public way than we, we have been able to. So I don't think these stories are lost in history. I just don't think history has been ready to look at them until now. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies if we didn't get to your question. I'm going to now hand over to the organisers. Thank you. It was an absolute privilege chairing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for, for chairing. And I would like to also thank our uh, three fascinating presenters, panellists, for an amazing uh, and fascinating somewhat depressing presentations uh, but but really uh, thank you so much for 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 this uh, informative uh, presentations and for this fascinating panel uh, and uh, I would like to uh, give uh, the floor to uh, Boaz Cohen uh, to conclude this session and this whole event and to thank you all for coming Buzz? Okay. Uh, thank you. I want to thank first uh, the organizing team, which is Roni and Daniela and Jan and Yaron, because uh, a lot of people ask me, how does Western Galilee, which is a very small college, uh, run this such an amazing program with so many participants and so many great researchers uh, presenting? And the answer is that I have an online team. <laughs> this is the answer. And these are uh, uh, who volunteer to do this. And uh, as we all volunteer for the extra teaching uh, 
projects we do. And the, it is thanks to them that we can do this. And also the input, it's not only about organizing. I mean, I was uh, pushing all the time to do a project, uh, a, a seminar on gender and Holocaust. I thought it was very important to do it. Uh, but Ron is the one who uh, made sure I knew about uh, International Women's Day, which is not really on regularly on my calendar. So uh, <laughs> it was really important that we build this. And uh, I really want to thank uh, all of you for this. And uh, there were mentions here of, uh, there is amazing research on children's home by Daniel Edron on France, by Joanna uh, Miklitz on uh, Poland, by Emuna uh, Nachman Gafni on Poland. There, are, there is research. What I'm trying to do is to look at the stuff, to look at the, the, the people who are running it. And in this case, the woman who is running it. I'm interested in how they approach the work, not only the experiences of the children, which are of course important. And I think every, you know, we all know that it has become like being in, a, today being a researcher and Zoom is like being in a candy shop, someone said. There's so many events, all of them at the same time. And you just, you can spend all your whole days or attending events or listening to recordings. I heard of someone who falls asleep with recording. Uh, and the, the fact that we are able to build a platform where researchers are attending and young and more veteran researchers who are uh, exchanging views, who are uh, presenting, we have we give uh, the floor to people at the beginning of their career and to people who are already well uh, known. And I think this is an amazing opportunity we have. And this is uh, what uh, pushes us to keep doing this. It's not uh, having this platform where researchers can uh, speak and be heard. So thank you everyone. And we will see you next month. I know that maybe Daniela wants me already to mention the next event. Uh, give me, bear with me a minute. Uh, I'm sorry, I plan to open this uh, this uh, invitation before the, okay, so we are talking about uh, uh, the next event, the next month's event is on uh, April 6th. We will have an event on uh, new avenues in Eastern European Holocaust research uh, with uh, Dr. Uyurachenko and Dr. Waitman Waitborn speaking about uh, the Ustasha and about the Yanovska concentration camp. So this is what we are looking forward to. On uh, May, we will have a, a, a conference on uh, not only Holocaust, but also Holocaust ego documents and an event of Ghetto Fighters House, which we cooperate on, uh, for the Children's Museum on Children in the Holocaust. We all come together again to the same subjects. And uh, we put out a call for papers. If you didn't notice, then look for it or ask us. A call for papers for a conference on June 22. You already know why. July 22, sorry. You know why we are having this conference. It's for uh, it's about uh, Barbarossa and the beginning of mass murder. So uh, this one is with call for papers and applications and stuff. So it will be held on Zoom, but you are invited to apply. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing.